when we then know how to acquire the four chamber view, it is time to continue with the apical views with the five chamber view, the coronary sinus view, and also the atypical lateral view. The apical views are located at the apex of the heart, so the left ventricular apex in the fifth intercostal space approximately, but it varies. The marker also in this view, the five chamber view, coronary sinus view, and the atypical views points initially towards the left lateral. The patient is not strictly left lateral and you tilt from the four chamber view towards the five chamber view and in the other direction towards the coronary sinus view. Here you have the overview of the views and the tilting and the rotation again. So for the coronary sinus view, you tilt downwards and for the five chamber view, you tilt upwards towards the aortic path. The tilting upwards and downwards is the key to optimize your images and get optimal views. What can you see in a five chamber view? We do see it here on the graphic. We lose parts of the right atrium and the left atrium. Overall, the fifth chamber is not entirely correct. It's the aortic valve, so it's a valvular structure, which we call five chamber view. And the fifth chamber, here we have the LVOT, the left ventricle and still parts of the right ventricle are seen. You see the most anterior part of the septum and as mentioned, you lose some information of the atria and also of the right ventricle. How does it translate now in echocardiography? Here we have an echo image. Here we see the aortic valve as the fifth chamber. Some information of the right atrium and the left atrium and the right ventricle is lost. But still we can see in this patient with amyloid heart disease, the severely thickened left ventricular walls and here the LVOT and also the thickened aortic valve. In another patient, we can also use color Doppler to see if there is stenosis or regurgitation present. Here we do not see any kind of flow turbulence, so that is the normal flow towards the valve. We have a very, very small insignificant jet right here, which resembles mild or minimal aortic regurgitation. Measuring the peak velocity is imminent when you are using measurements of the aortic valve. You have here the continuous wave Doppler. You have the focus of this line here in the aortic valve. And you see here that's the aortic valve signal. So here you would measure the peak signal. It should be in the range of 1 to 1.5 meters per second. Always keep in mind for this view, you can move a little bit more lateral to have a more optimal angulation of the continuous wave Doppler signal. Using pulse wave Doppler, we also discussed it in the chapter of aortic stenosis. You can also see a great part of LVOT measuring and the videos about fluid status, about volume status. And here you place the pulse wave Doppler at the area of the LVOT. First, I would recommend that you place it in the aortic valve, move a big, bit backwards, and then you get this nice flow signal with a black curve in the center, which then is the LVOT curve where you see it's also around one meter per second, which is normal. In case of aortic regurgitation, you have to visualize Initially with color Doppler, you see here the small flare that is mild AR, a little bit more than the trivial we saw just in the case before. It's a central jet. It goes into the left ventricle. It borders here the sigmoidal septum, but it's not really hemodynamically relevant. We do see the left ventricle here, the sigmoidal septum, so the prominent septum in a female patient in her 60s with hypertension. And you do see that the LVOT is a little bit narrowed due to the septum. And we do see this caudal SAM, so these structures, the corda, are moving towards the interventricular septum, but not the anterior mitral valve leaflet. So it's a little bit of a flow turbulence due to a narrowing, but not hemodynamically relevant. Furthermore, note in this patient, the overall small left ventricular cavity and the high normal ejection fraction. When this patient is hypovolemic, this gradient or possibly becomes hemodynamically relevant. Here by taking a look at a patient 
he had a repair as a child left to right shunt. Here we do see a rest of the shunt with a dilated right ventricle, which led to volume overload of the right ventricle and therefore failing of the left and the right ventricle. You see also the left ventricle is dilated, the ejection fraction is borderline, so mildly reduced. And this was a still persistent shunt after a sinus valsalva rupture operation. The patient received another pericardial patch and no shunt was visible anymore. But that is something you can see quite nicely here when you visualize the aortic valve and the LVOT. Here I have examples of a patient who received a mitral clip, coronary artery disease, reduced left ventricular function and severe mitral regurgitation. And due to the clip, there is a flow of turbulence across the mitral valve inside the left ventricle. And here at the aortic valve, you have some flow turbulence, not a significant stenosis, and also a mild aortic regurgitation. So color Doppler very often can help to differentiate and to get an overview of what you might encounter when you use continuous wave or pulsed wave Doppler measurements. Here we have another example of why to use color Doppler in this five chamber view. Of course, for AR, of course, for aortic stenosis, LVOT obstruction and also membranes are very important. And in this case, this was a point of care imaging device. You do see that there's a valvular structure. It's a tower and the leaflets, they look severely thickened. That was a case of endocarditis with, you can see here, the regurgitation. And by using color Doppler, you do see if there are also valvular lesions present, for example, AS or aortic regurgitation, as in this case.